Hopefully these are good strong windows. There we go. Well, we are on and All we are right. live. Let me sit down. So uh, that's good. And that means uh, some people, I, I started it just a hair late, so hopefully everybody's going to be like, hey, it's going. So um, that'll be good. I am surprised at how many people we do have uh, watching it through the course of the week. So very grateful for that. And I'm uh, just going to wait a handful of seconds more. Um, and I'll welcome everybody that's tuning in on Facebook. And I'll welcome everybody that's here. And uh, we've got a little bit of a rainy, uh, rainy evening, but that's all right. Um, let me do this one other thing, too, to make sure everybody can hear. There we go. All right. There we are. Put that over to the side so I don't get double it up or anything. Um, as we begin tonight, let me uh, let me ask everybody to continue to pray for Tom Whitfield. Um, this is Stephanie's father, our secretary's dad. Um, he had to get taken back to um, the hospital yesterday, um, yesterday evening, and. Uh, Got a little confirmation today as uh, Stephanie talked to her mom um, that he had had another stroke. Um, he is currently in the ICU unit, um, so they're watching out over him and uh, doing tests, trying to figure out exactly uh, what the next course of action is. Um, but I would ask that you would continue to remember Stephanie and uh, remember her family in your prayers. Um, I know it's a lot to go through. Um, I do know that they're going to at least watch him for 24 hours trying to figure out how everything's going and just kind of assess everything. So please remember Tom Whitfield in your prayers. Pray for healing and help. Um, this evening, who else can, uh, can we remember in our prayers? I can talk to somebody else. But I already say, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, it's always... Always kind of nice not to hear uh, hear of anybody else that uh, might be sick or in need. Uh, continue to remember our nation um, politically, and as we still have this health crisis, um, let's also remember our nation um, as still is a lot of unrest, still a lot of things going on that way um, as well. Let's remember our teachers and our students as they are continuing to teach and learn. Um, through distance learning, and I know in the next couple of weeks, uh, choices got to be made about whether or not to go back or, or what that's going to look like. Um, so let us pray for uh, all our all our kids and uh, all the teachers as well um, that everything will go well. Let's go before the Lord, remembering these that have been mentioned, as well as those that are on our hearts. Father God, as we uh, come before you today, we give you thanks and praise that we're able to come here. We're able to have this Bible study. We're able to um, be able to be plugged in, um, to be online, to allow other people to see and watch and learn. And uh, I pray that this, this time would be a blessing for all those that are watching as well as those that are here. Um, Father, please, please help us to go closer and grow closer to you. Um, and as we bow before you now, we want to lift up those that are on our prayer list, um, for the many that are, are sick and upon the beds of affliction, uh, for those that are in need of your grace each and every day as we remember our first responders, our police, as we lift up our nation. May your hand be upon us. And Lord, I pray that you would also, Lord, be with us. Be with our nation as we go through this pandemic together. Help us to help us to pull through. Lord, we know that we will get through this. We pray that you would you would speed that along. Lord, for our students and for our teachers as they learn and as they teach, we know this isn't the ideal circumstance. We know we want things back to, to normalcy, and Lord, we pray that that would happen soon that it would be safe, it would be good. Lord, we know we, we've just got to trust your time. And that's what we do right now. We place our trust in you. We ask that you would help us as only you can. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning to Ephesians chapter 6. 
Um, Ephesians chapter uh, 6, verse 14. Um, the Word of God says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. We're continuing talking about the armor of God. We're up to the very first piece of armor. And that is the belt of truth. And uh, kind of in parentheses, I've got that idea of sincerity. And we'll be talking about that in just a bit. Just like last week, uh, talked about how firm a foundation and how that hymn really, really coincides with what we're talking about in the idea of the armor of God. Uh, I want to continue to talk about that. And the hymn... It's not within our hymnal, not within the celebration hymnal, but I actually have uh, hymnals in my office that has this. And that's one entitled, I Would Be True. Anybody ever heard that hymn or sang it? I Would Be True. I had not heard of it since, until doing a little research and um, uh, learning a little bit more about this. Uh, I'd like to give just a little bit of a, a story behind it because it was written by three different individuals. The first person that, that kind of started everything was a man by the name of Howard Walter. Um, he wrote stanzas one, two, and three. Joseph Peake wrote the music arrangement. And then Samuel Harlow wrote stanzas four through six. Howard Walter was born on the 19th of August in 1883 in New Britain, Connecticut, in the United States. At 23 years of age, he spent a year in Japan teaching English at the Waseda University, and while there, he wrote the first three stanzas of the hymn, I Would Be True. He sent it to his mother in the United States, and she forwarded it to Harper's Magazine, which published it. He later became a missionary with the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, in Sri Lanka and in India. Unfortunately, Harold passed at only 35 years of age, November 1st, 1918, in Lahore, India. Joseph Yates, who wrote the music, was born in 1843 in New York. Uh, he, he worked as a carpenter, a farmer, a drugstore clerk before serving in the American Civil War. And then he became a florist. But after that, he became a Methodist lay minister and traveled the U.S. He traveled to Maine, Florida, and even to California. He played the violin, the piano, and the banjo. And as a member of the Nostra de Cloud Methodist Episcopal Church in Brooklyn, he became a fully ordained minister just two months before his passing at age 68. Samuel Harlow, born the 20th of July in 1885 in Boston, was an ordained congregational minister. He became a chaplain, a sociology teacher, and uh, at the International College in uh, Smyrna, Turkey, when World War I began, was where he was at. He served as the director of the YMCA for the American forces in France. And in 1923, he joined Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. He served, served 30 years as a professor. And all of these individuals, they, they contributed to this poem that you have in front of you. Some have called it a creed, but it talks so much about the sincerity of life. And here's an interesting note. A, a mother by the name of, of Dorothy had a son. And he was, he had a Bible, it was a confirmation Bible, and she wrote this poem. I would be true in the front of it. Dorothy's full name was Dorothy Walker Bush. Her son, George Herbert Walker Bush. Listen to these words. I would be true, for there are those who would trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there is much to suffer. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. I would be friend of all, the foe and friendless, 
I would be giving and forget the gift. I would be humble, for I know my weakness. I would look up and laugh and love and live. I would be faithful through each passing moment. I would be constantly in touch with God. I would be strong to follow where He leads me. I would have faith to keep the path Christ trod. Who is so low that I am not His brother? Who is so high that I have no path to Him? Who is so poor I may not feel His hunger? Hunger. Who is so rich I may not pity Him? Who is so hurt I may not know His heart? Who sings for joy my heart may never shake? Who is God's heaven has passed beyond my vision? Who to hell's depths where I may not never fail? May none then call on me for understanding. May none then turn to me for help in pain. And drain alone his bitter cup of sorrow. Or find he knocks upon my heart in vain. This poem, this hymn, talks about one thing, the sincerity of heart, of someone striving to be their absolute best, of being someone of true and genuine character. And that's what our, our study has brought us to, the belt of truth. The belt of truth, talking about sincerity. Uh, in our previous study, we saw that uh, we are engaged in spiritual war. It's present. It's something that we have. But Jesus Christ did not leave us defenseless. He gave us this armor. He gave us these things to put on, to fight and resist against temptation and evil. We noted that the Roman army was the fighting force of this time. The Roman army was what helped conquer basically the known world at this time. And here Paul, as he's writing Ephesians, is shackled to a, a Roman soldier. So he was very familiar with all this armor. And here, Paul likens God's powerful spiritual resources to the armor and weaponry of the soldier. And as we begin, I want to give you two reasons, because I think it's important that we understand this, that we have two reasons why many Christians don't have a strong, victorious Christian life. Two reasons, just real quick. Number one, they don't know what their spiritual armor and weaponry consists of. That they don't understand, they don't know what is available to them. If you don't know what's available to you, why in the world would you use it? The other is this, they simply fail or refuse to use their armor and weaponry. They just refuse to use the armor or the weaponry. How many of y'all ever said this to your parents or had this said to you? Oh, I don't need a coat. I'm fine. Have you ever you know, had to go back in and get that coat? You know, you go outside, it's like four degrees outside, and you're like, oh, this is a bad idea. <laughs> We, we sometimes, we refuse to do what we know we ought to. In tonight's study, we're going to begin to examine this armor and the weaponry a little bit more in detail. And, uh, we've got three parts here, just real quick, three parts. And the first is the belt. The belt. The first piece of equipment Paul mentions is the belt. And, and strictly speaking, if we really look at it, the belt isn't, you know, so much a piece of armor, as it is, you know, kind of an accessory almost. In, in fact, if I had all of the pieces of armor that are mentioned here in Ephesians chapter 6, you know, we have the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, the sword, and all these things, and we're like, hey, we're going to go into battle, you need to pick a piece of armor, the belt would not be number one. Number one would probably be the helmet, because you want to protect your, your, your head. You know, after that, probably the breastplate, because this really, it's, it's a big, it's an important piece. You know, beyond that, the sword, the shield, there are, you know, more weapons, in, but, you know, a shield is, is really important to keep your guard up with. Most likely, the belt is going to be the very last thing, because what in the world is the belt good for? I want you to notice two things, though, when we're talking about this. The belt was essential, and it was so important, because the belt held the rest of the armor in place 
and supported the sword. It was the very first thing that was put on the belt was important. By the way, anybody that has had a bad fitting pair of pants know what and how important a belt is. Because if you did not have that, you're in trouble. The pants are just going to be falling down. You're going to be holding them up, walking around. You can't do anything right if you've got your, uh, your pants just not, not right. So it was essential there, but notice also this. The belt acted as a girdle which collected together the soldiers' long undergarments about their waist. It ensured that the undergarments wouldn't trip up the soldier in combat and it provided needed support and additional strength. It's the idea that all those other loose and baggy clothes were kept tight. They were kept close to the body so that you could actually do what you needed to do. You could go and, and run and do the, the battle. You could fight like you really needed to. So this belt was absolutely essential. So that's the belt, but I also want to look at the, the truth. And, and right in parentheses, you can put sincerity. Sincerity. When Paul says that this belt is truth, the Greek word that he uses is ale aletheo. Aletheo can be understand, understood in one of two ways. It can be objective truth or subjective truth. Objective truth is things we don't argue about. It's things that we just simply know. In 2020, Raleigh is the capital of North Carolina. That's, that's objective. There's, you know, we prove it. I go to whatever documents we need to. It just simply is the truth. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's mascot is the ring. You know, it's the Tar Heel. That's, that's who they are. Duke University's mascot is the Blue Devil. Those, those are just simply things that are objectively true. But what about subjective truth? Subjective truth is a little bit different. It has to do with personal things. It's things that cannot be verified with like a ruler. You can't go out and measure it. You can't put it under a microscope, but you can see it. I, here's, a, here's a very simple one. And what is my opinion about coconuts? You don't like it. I do not like it. That's a subjective truth because I still don't like it. I keep trying it. I smelled it. I, I made a cake the other day with it. And uh, the icing on a German chocolate cake. I, I still didn't like it. I was like, why in the world am I doing this? But <laughs> it, it, that, that's something. But you know what? It's true in my life. You can see it. You're not going to catch me with some macaroon in my hand. or You know, you're not going to see me um, going in and going, whoa, look, coconut milk, that's what I want to drink. You're not going to see me doing that. But you see it throughout my life. We call it being genuine, sincere. It is a truth that is a characteristic of my life. When Paul is talking about the belt of truth, I believe he's talking about the belt of being sincere of being genuine within our Christian life. And let me give you two reasons why. First is this. Paul says in verse 17 that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The objective truths that Christ died and was buried and rose again, the objective truths of the Word of God, it's already taken care of in here. The truth of the Word of God is taken care of in the sword of the Spirit. But we also see this, sincerity for the Christian soldier performed the exact same function as the belt did for the Roman soldier. And that's what we're going to actually end on tonight as we get through this idea of sincerity. Because we need to understand what is Paul talking about? What is our call to be sincere Christians. And we can look at throughout all of Scripture, we can see what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the idea of being sincere, of having a belt of truth about us. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him 
and serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you this day for your good. It's the idea of having our heart that says, Jesus, with whatever I do, I want to please you. My heart, my life, everything I am, sincerely, I want to, to please you. I want to be the Christian that you want me to be. I want to be a reflection of Christ. Just like we've been talking about in the book of Galatians. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's not about me anymore, but just my life is what I want to uh, use to please God. Joshua 24, verse 14. I know in your, in your notes, I gave you all these scripture references. All of those, are, I'm just going to be reading them. And, and I gave them so that if you want to look them up later, you can. Joshua 24, and 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Psalm 51, and verse 6. Behold, you desire truth, sincerity, in the innermost being. Matthew 10 verses 37 through 39 Jesus states that he wants his followers to be sincere, to have that complete commitment. He who loves the father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Luke 14, 26, 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. He who does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus was clear. He said, look, if you want to come after me, it's got to be in sincerity. You just can't give lip service. You just can't act like it on the outside. It has to be something rooted down deep that a genuine and real change has come into your life. Hebrews 10 and verse 22, we are beckoned to draw near to God with a sincere heart. 1 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul likens the Christian life to the Jewish feast of unleavened bread. And he says, don't celebrate it with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the bread of sincerity in truth. That, that's the idea. Sadly, and unfortunately, we live in a society today, which we have a lot of people that would say, hey, lip service, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Come to church periodically. Read the Bible periodically. And say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm the one that wants to, to serve Jesus. I'm the one that wants to, to do all of these things, but in their heart of hearts, it's not really there. Titus 1 and verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him, being destitute and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Back when I was uh, kindergarten, first, second grade, um, I was uh, like most boys at that time, I was enamored with He-Man. Uh, He-Man was, I mean, that was the cartoon to watch. Um, I, I watched a little documentary on, on how much money He-Man made, and it blew my mind how, how much money He-Man could make in one year just with all of the stuff that was sold. But you know, I, I was one that had some of the merchandise. I actually don't have this one now. But you could actually buy He-Man's outfit. He-Man really didn't have a huge outfit. He had swords. He had a sword. He had a shield. He had this thing that you'd wear. He had a belt. And I remember I had that belt. And boy, I, I, I'm proud of that belt. It wasn't like Batman's utility belt. It was He-Man's belt. And I could put that on. It was all plastic and everything. It just had a little thing. I had to play it being he -Man. That belt did me absolutely no good when it came to my pants. It was a pay belt, play belt. I mean, it was all it was. It, it wasn't anything that was real. It was all make-believe. Can I say this? I think a lot of Christians, if we really dug down to it, their belt would just be make-believe. 
That idea of being prepared for battle, of getting ready, of, of clamping everything on. Uh, yeah, it looks good, but it's really not genuine. It's not a belt of sincerity, but rather a belt of hypocrisy. Matthew 6, 1 through 6, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trump before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you, pay, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Verses 16 through 18, Jesus continues, Whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The idea is, hey, don't, don't do it just for show, but do it in the sincerity of your hearts. Philippians 1, uh, Paul talks about it again. Paul describes these people again in, in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 5, men of a depraved mind, they're not there for the right reasons. John chapter 6 and verse 26 it talks about the differences between those that truly are following him and those that are not. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but instead you ate of the loaves and were filled. There are those that genuinely, truly follow after Christ. And that's the idea of putting on that belt of truth. That in the sincerity of their hearts and of their lives, they understand, hey, I'm here. And I'm here for the right reasons. That compels us as well. It, it compels us within our own life to say, okay, you know what? Why am I here? Why do I come to church? Why did I become a Christian? Why am I following Christ? Is it all just for show? Or am I really here because on the cross, Christ died for me, gave me new life, and my life is now His. Is your heart genuine. 1 Peter 2 and verse 1, let us dedicate ourselves to the Lord, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy. Jesus reminds us we only serve one master. We can't serve one and, and the other at the same time. We've only got one that we can in fact truly serve. And that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to do throughout all of the scriptures. I'm not going to go through all of the other ones that are here, but that is the push. That's the push and the gist of all of, of what we're going after here, the focus of what Paul is getting at within this idea of the belt of truth, of getting ready. This soldier, when he was getting ready for battle, this was the very first thing that he put on. He couldn't put on a shield. He couldn't grab his sword. He couldn't go and, and get everything else ready because the belt is what made everything else possible. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Are we truly committed? I, I, I know this. If I were to have all of uh, all these instruments and, and all of these uh, pieces of armor out, uh, if I were able to get uh, some pieces of armor on Sunday morning and have the kids come up and and have them all come and say, all right, y'all can, can play with the armor. Y'all can, you know, y'all can, can do what you want to, 
That'd be fun to watch for a little while until somebody started swinging. You see the kids, they put on the helmet, grab the shield, get the sword, maybe put on the shoes, put on that breastplate. But they would ignore the battles. But you know what? For those that are serious, those that are serious would go, you know what? I need to figure out what I have to do to get this stuff on the right. Start me out with the right things. If we are truly serious, that is why that is what we will show in our life by the idea of the bells of truth. And that's actually point number three. So we have the belt, we have truth. Number three, of course, the belts of truth. Notice the belt's per purpose. It held the rest of the armor in place, including the sword. If you don't first have a genuine desire to do what is right in serving the Lord, all the other stuff won't matter. All the other stuff will be forgotten. There's no point to it. Because if you're not willing to take the first step, what's the point in getting everything else there? Rarely will the hypocrite the pretend, or the pretender take the time to exert the energy to improve themselves spiritually. They don't have the desire to spiritually grow. Therefore, they simply don't grow. On the other hand, the sincere will will earnestly desire to take up and put on the full armor of God. You know, secondly, we see this. The belt acted like a girdle which collected together the soldiers' long undergarments about the waist. This provided the needed extra support and the additional strength in the time of battle. Um, you know, Kent loves some bat baseball. You know, I have not, I've only gone to a handful of baseball games in my life, but I do know some things. I know that when the baseball players go out there, their uh, their baseball uniforms are uh, they're not loose fitting, are they? They're uh, you know they they they're not like tight; they can't move. But they're not they're not loose fitting. I mean, you, you don't go out there looking like uh, you know the wizard Gandalf with a big old flowing robe, right? That'd be kind of crazy to watch. But why 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 wouldn't you want something all floppy like that? Slow you down when you're running the bases. Slow you down when you're running bases. What about when you're like batting? You know, you, you could, you know, wait, wipe out the guy in behind you, and you probably couldn't get, you know, really good, really good swing. The idea that belt, we think about the garments, think about all the stuff in life. All the crazy stuff in life that we have going on. Think about all the crazy stuff we had going on even before 2020. You had your, your day planner, you had your night planner, places to go, people to see, parties to attend, sporting events to go to, school stuff to do, work you had to get done, got to help some other people, got all these other things. Isn't life so much better when there's one thing in charge? And it says, all right, I'm going to order all this, put it into place. I'm going to tell you where to go and what to do. And I'm going to put you under control. That's the idea of the belt of truth. I'm saying, you know what, I've got all this stuff in my life. It's all going every which way. But you know what, I'm going to wrap it up. And I'm going to put it up underneath the control of Almighty God. And God's going to be the one who gives my priority strength. God is the one who's going to give me the direction. God is the one who's going to gird all of these things about me so that I might have that full armor. Oh. It's noteworthy in the parable of the sower and the seeds in Luke chapter 8, verses 11 through 18. The characteristic which was specified as being had by those who thrived and bore fruit for the Lord, as opposed to those who fell away during a time of temptation, persecution, and trial, was having heard and obeyed the gospel in an honest 
in good heart and that hold it fast without sincere love and a sincere faith in the Lord the lightest of persecutions the easiest of temptations the most mediocre of trials can sidetrack us and sideline us from doing God's will let me ask, do you have sincerity? Are we totally and utterly committed to Him? Notice the Scripture's urging as we close. The first is this, live for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. And he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and, raised for them, and was raised for them. But also this, live sincerely for Christ. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, Get rid of the old yeast, that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I know I've used this illustration before, but I love it, and I wish I could. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall watching this go, go down. There was a basketball coach, and the basketball coach had a very successful program. And of course, every year he did the same thing. He came out, and you know, he had all these new players, you got all these older players that have heard it before, and he gets everybody, and he all sits them down, and he says, all right, guys, we're going to get started, and we're going to do a great job this year. So we're going to start with the basics. He sits everybody down and he pulls out a pair of socks. And all these players are like, what are you doing? This is the socks. How in the world? We're, we're, we're playing basketball. We want to get out and start running and learning all of these other things. We want to start learning formations and, and different drills and we want to start doing all of these things. And he says, listen, we're going to teach you first how to properly put socks on. Because you're going to find out that if you do not put your socks on properly in the course of the game, your feet are going to get blisters. You're not going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to jump. You're not going to be able to play like you need to. And a basketball player who can't run, who can't jump, who can't dribble, who can't do all any of those things, can't do anything for this team. And it dawned on the players then. you got to take care of first things first. Paul says, before anything else, the belt that you have to put on is the one of sincerity. That our hearts have to be aligned to God and say, Lord, it's all of you. It's not of me. It's not anything else, but it's all of you. And you are. Let's bow and pray. Father God, Lord, thank you for your word and, and how it challenges us and Lord, I pray that you would help us. For we know each day we have to ask that question, are we really being sincere in our faith? Are we really being ones that are going out as your soldiers? Or are we just playing? I pray that we would take this truth to heart, that we would live it out in our life, but also that we would encourage others by it. Please dismiss us now with your love and watch out over us as we travel. May we have safety to come back again.
to worship you. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I forgot to do questions, comments, observations. Y'all are dismissed then. Y'all have a great night. I, I still cannot quite get over the fact that it's dark outside right now. I can actually see out, and I don't see light. I see, like, dark. So, welcome to September, everyone. Uh, we're we're going to get to fall here eventually. To everybody that was listening on Facebook, thank y'all so much, too. I'm going to go ahead and cut the feed now.